Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel and welcome to building a wireless sensor network with the NRF24L01 and this is going to be part two in a four to five part series. If you haven't seen part one yet, I recommend you check it out before you watch part two. And to everybody that commented in with design suggestions or corrections or whatever from part one, I really appreciate that. I hope to keep it coming in part two and throughout the series. All right, let's get started. So in part two, what are we going to cover? We're going to cover why we're saying just say no to voltage regulators. We're going to talk everything about powering the device, battery sizing, battery life, how to monitor the battery. We're also doing a, a design change. I mentioned as I go through this, you know, I may be changing because I'm, I'm designing this in real time as I make this series. So I'm actually going to make a change for the temperature sensor, and I'll explain why I'm doing that. Now, I will apologize ahead of time. I said in part one and part two we'd get into the code. But really, I realized that this this content matter, the power stuff, actually takes up more than enough to be to have a single part dedicated to it. Okay, so why did I choose no voltage regulators, or what is a voltage regulator, and why do we need it? Well, one of the things about batteries when you're using a battery powered device is as a battery discharges, its voltage will change. So as it starts to discharge, its voltage will slowly drop until it's quote unquote dead or discharged. So typically, a lot of times, people want to use voltage regulators to basically take that battery voltage that's changing and keep it as a constant voltage so we know we're getting constantly 3.3 volts or 3 volts or whatever. But the problem with voltage regulators is, first of all, they use power themselves. I mean, they're not perfect. So whether we're talking about a linear voltage regulator or switch mode voltage regulator like a DC to DC converter, they use power. Now, a switch mode one uses a lot less power or should say is much more efficient, but when you talk about switch mode DC to DC converters, they're more complex. They have other external components. If you want the ones that are real efficient, they typically don't come in maker-friendly through-hole versions. They're typically small surface mount devices. So a lot of those factors are, are why I wanted to stay away, away from voltage regulators. And I know some people suggested, you know, they have chips out there that are dedicated to handling battery power, things like that. Once again, cost, complexity, wanted to make this design simple, low cost. So if we're not using a voltage regulator and we're just going to use the battery, what does that mean? Well, I have some discharge diagrams of, of AA alkaline batteries, and I have these just as an example. You could take any battery and it would have a similar discharge curve, but it shows that for alkaline, a double, AA, you know, you're typically going to start above 1.5 volts for a single cell, and it's going to discharge, and sometime, you know, shortly after 1 volt or 0.8 volts, it's pretty much dead. And one thing, though, I want you to take from these curves, though, is the fact that the rate of discharge, so if you look at the top one, that's 500 milliamps, so meaning they, they draw 500 milliamps from it continuously until it's dead, and then the bottom one is 100 milliamps. So one thing you should notice is the less amperage you pull from the battery, the longer the battery will last or the more milliamp or I should say amp hours you'll get out of the battery. And that's typically true with all with most batteries I've worked with. There may be others that aren't like that. I don't know. But with batteries I've worked with, that's true. And that's good for our design because we don't use a lot of current because we're using sleep mode. So we should get a lot of amp hours out of the battery we use. Another thing to point out is, is the voltage change. The voltage change, the components on our board, and I'm going to get into more detail of this, have certain operating voltages, and we need to stay in those operating voltages to for everything to work right. So that's one challenge we're going to have with the batteries, and I'll talk about that more next. And I'll I'll just mention that I got these plots from PowerStream, and there's their web address. They have great information on, on batteries if you want to check it out. Okay, so one of the challenges I mentioned was voltages. So we, if we don't have a, any type of voltage regulator, we need to make sure that our parts are operating within their specified voltage ranges so the design's going to work. So I, I apologize, this is sort of a busy slide, but at the top I just cut little, I cut snippets from data sheets here. So at the top I have the NRF24L01 transceiver module, and you can see that it can operate down to 1.9 volts. So we can operate that from 3.6 down to 1.9 volts, and that's the supply as well as the, the logic. Over here, I have the temperature sensor, and this is the reason I changed temperature sensor. So the other temperature sensor, and I forget what it was, it's like the D18B12 
20 or something. That one's great because it was accurate and it was actually low cost. The problem with it though is it only went down to three volts. And so that was sort of the showstopper for that one. So I'm choosing the STTS751 made by ST Micro. This actually is not quite as accurate as the, the one I ordered, the first one I talked about in part one, but it can go down to 2.25 volts. Now, if you remember, I've been using the TMP36 as a substitute because I don't have any of these in stock yet. I have them on order. The TMP can only go down to 2.7 volts, and its accuracy is not as good as the STTS751. So that's why I'm going with that one. You can use the TMP36 if you want, but it's only going to go down to 2.7 volts. As we're going to see, as you're going to see, that's going to affect the, the battery we, we end up choosing or how we power our device. So remember these voltage levels. Now, lastly, I'll mention the Atmega 328P, which is the Arduino chip, the microcontroller we're going to use on our boards. Now, they, they can operate down to 1.8 volts, but there's a range of clock frequencies you can use in that curve. So they basically say, all right, if you want this voltage level, here's a safe operating area of a clock speed you should have. So the lower in voltage you go, the slower the clock speed. And I decided to use an 8 megahertz clock because I did want to operate this down around 3 volts. I knew that. And the Pro Mini, the Arduino Pro Mini, has, an, has a version that's 8 megahertz. Now I could go lower, but then I have to find an Arduino bootloader that, that goes down to the lower frequency. So to keep things simple, I went with 8 megahertz. And that's going to allow me, and once again, you can look at this curve they have in, from the data sheet. And if I do 8 megahertz, you can do a linear you know, slope calculation to figure out that that allows me to operate that chip down to 2.4 volts. And to be honest, you know, the safe operating zone, if you go out of it, it doesn't necessarily mean the chip's going to explode or something. But so we, you know, you, we probably could push the limit here and we probably get good operation down below 2.4, maybe 2.3. But, you know, we want to stay close to the safe operating area. So you can see from a voltage standpoint, the Atmega 328P is going to be our limiter for us how low voltage we can go when we have a battery powering this design. Okay, with that said... We're almost going to get to the part where we talk about the, the battery we're going to use. But first, let me talk about estimating battery life and how much amp hours we, we should have. So here I have a, a screenshot from an advanced power supply that I have at my workplace that gives a very accurate measurement of dynamic current. So here it's measuring the voltage, and the voltage is constant, and I have it set at around 3 volts. But here... Uh, the current is dynamic, and the reason is is it, it's our this is our device, our end device going through its stages. So I have it on a one second transmit interval just to make this easy to show. But here we go down to very low current. It actually says negative 0.05 milliamps, and I actually measured this a little more accurately. So it is about 50 milliamps. It's actually a little uh, less than uh, 50 milliamps, but excuse me, I'm saying 50 milliamps, 50 microamps. So when we're asleep, when our device goes to sleep, it's not doing anything, it goes to sleep, it's not transmitting. Then it wakes up, some things are done, and it takes actually a half second. I'm not quite sure why it takes a half second, but this is stuff that's happening in the, you know, the NRF24 libraries that I'm using. And then it finally transmit. And this is why you see this big pulse, because the power amplifier is transmitting the, the data out. And you know, the more data you transmit, the bigger this pulse will get. But basically, this, this little action here is about 7 milliamps, and it lasts for a half second. This is about 35 milliamps, and it lasts for only a millisecond. So we can use this information to estimate how much power we're going to need or charge we're going to need from a battery, as well as how long might our design last when it's operating in the field on a certain type of battery. So what I did was I assumed, okay, I'm not going to operate this at one second intervals. I'll probably do 10 minute intervals where it'll be sleeping most of the time. It'll wake up briefly, take some measurements, transmit that to the coordinator or to the base unit, then go back to sleep. And so if we do that, that means, you know, 10 minutes is 600 seconds. That means for 599.5 seconds, we're, we're using the sleep current. That's how much current we're drawing. Now, for almost a half a second, we use 7 milliamps, 
And then the most current we use is when we transmit, but it's a small percentage of this 10 minutes. So you can do a weighted average calculation to get what is, you know, in that 10 minute period, what is my average current draw? So here it comes to 55, basically 56 microamps. And once again, that's because this term is essentially dominating it because these things happen a very short period of time within that 10 minutes. So I say, okay, let's just say, let's, you know, round up to be safe and say it's 60 microamps per hour. And we can do that because we know that the, the cycle just repeats every 10 minutes. So we can say, you know, this uses 60 microamps on average in an hour time. It's drawing 60 microamps on average during that hour period. So if we had a battery pack that's, let's say, 1,000 milliamp hours or one amp hour, that would mean if we're drawing this amount of current, you know, we're assuming that we're not doing any testing or the LEDs aren't going off, but if we're running the device as normal, as long as we can, based off of this battery power, we're going to get, and, and basically I divide it by 24 to turn it from hours to days, we're going to get 694 days of operation. So that's almost two years before we'd have to change the battery, assuming that we had a good voltage level and we're using a battery that, that had this much um, charge in it to deliver to us. So with that said, what I plan to do for the batteries, and you can do something similar or a little different, is I plan to use two AAA batteries in series. So AAA batteries, just like AA, are going to be 1.5 to 1.6 volts when they're new. They're going to have 800 to 1,000 milliamp hours. Once again, and it could actually be more because we're drawing such a little current, but let's say that's somewhere around there. So we know that the battery is going to be able to last. We're using two in series, so these voltages add, so we'll be just above three volts or at three volts when we start. We can discharge it down to about 2.4 volts or maybe a little less before we have to worry about our microcontroller not working correctly. So in that, we should be able to get you know 800 to 1,000 milliamp hours, I think is a pretty safe assumption. Even if we were down below 800, let's say 700, we'd still get plenty of battery runtime. Now, I'm going to probably use alkaline batteries for mine. If you do want to use rechargeable batteries, one thing I'll warn you is the, the nickel cadmium batteries, the rechargeable ones, their voltages, when you recharge them, a lot of times don't get back up to 1.5 volts, and they may only get back up to 1.2 or 1.25 and if that's the case, that means you're real close once you start, you know, after you recharge them and put them into your design, you're already close to 2.4 volts. So just something to keep in mind. Another option is you could use a lithium ion cell, which I believe at, you know, when they're fully charged, they're at about 3.6 or 3.7 volts. And you could probably use a single cell to last for a long time and they're rechargeable. One thing I will warn you, though, is, and someone mentioned this on the comments, that it is dangerous to discharge them too far down. So you want to make sure that you're able to know when it's dead and change it out. And we'll talk about how I'm going to do that, but you don't want to over discharge lithium ion batteries. Okay, so let's get into how we'll monitor the battery. For our ADC, and I mentioned this in part one, since we're using battery power, we're not going to have a constant voltage. So we can't use VCC as our voltage reference for the ADC because VCC is changing. The Atmega 328P has an option where you can select the internal voltage reference, and this is a voltage that the chip generates so it stays constant even if VCC is slowly changing, and that value is about 1.1 volts. So the, so the one issue we're going to have is if we want to measure the battery voltage, we're going to need to divide it down because 3 volts or 2.5 volts is too high. So I use, I'm going to use a voltage divider. And so I chose these values because I want high values because I want little current flow. You know, we don't want to waste much current with this. But at the same time, we don't want to make this too high or it starts to be in parallel with the impedance of the ADC. So we want to, I always try to stay below 1 meg. But here I have 560K and 180. So 560K, 180K. So we want to measure what's here. What I did is I took two resistors, because resistors are never exactly the value they say they are. I measured them. I then did a divide calc factor calculation. So I basically said, this is the factor that, that VCC is going to be divided down to at this point. And so that's essentially all you're doing is taking the one you're trying to look at, R2, 
then you add R1 and R2 together, you divide it, then you divide it into one to get your divide factor. And what the divide factor really is, is, you know, I'm going to measure here, and if I get 0.8 volts or something, I multiply it by 4.15 to get what the real value is here. And so what I actually do with this is in the code, which we'll get into in part three, I store this into EEPROM. I think I mentioned this in part one. EEPROM is almost like a hard drive, so I can store values there, and when my device turns off, they're not lost, and I can read them back when my device turns back on. So what I'm doing here is I want to make sure that I'm getting a good, accurate measurement here because I don't want to, you know, lose any of the – I don't want to uh, have a wrong voltage that gives me the wrong battery value. So I store this calibration factor in EEPROM, and then I can pull it out, calculate what my battery voltage is, and then I can alert the coordinator – if my battery is getting low and and you know telling me that I need to change it so let's do that let me uh, show a quick video of, of the battery circuit in action okay what you're looking at is the serial monitor on my computer and what I do is I have it connected to the coordinator so the coordinator is waiting for data from you know nodes uh, whether it's a router or an end device so I'm gonna hook up one end device for this example so here is, you know, my prototype end device. So you can see the app mega chip. You can see, you know, my transceiver. There's my temperature sensor. One thing that I couldn't fit on this board, though, was the voltage divider for checking the battery. So right here is my voltage divider, my 560 and my 180. So I'm going to measure in between there to see what my battery value is. And what I do, what I'm doing here is I actually have it hooked up to a power supply to simulate the battery. So I'm going to simulate the battery getting lower and lower. I'm going to test to make sure that I report back to the coordinator when my battery is too low. And just just to note, in this setup, I have it arbitrarily set to seven. Excuse me, 2.75 is when the end device will warn the coordinator that its battery is getting low. And then at 2.6 volts, this will go into what's known as battery shutdown. What I'm calling battery shutdown and will actually just continuously sleep. Every time it wakes up, it will go back to sleep. It will no longer transmit, just to ensure that it's using very little power. Now, in actuality, I'll probably go to lower values, but I just use 2.75 and 2.6 just for this example. So here, it's going to show the power supply that it's connected to. I turn the power supply on. The end device is getting power. This DMM is showing what the output of the power supply is and I just chose a value just above 3 volts you know random value 3.17 so then I go over to the coordinator the serial monitor and this is just showing that it's connected and every second it prints out so it goes to sleep it wakes up it measures the temperature it measures a random ADC value that nothing's connected to and then it also makes an ADC measurement of the voltage divider and it calculates if the battery is still good and it just reports a one or a zero. So a one means battery is fine. It's telling the coordinator battery is fine. If it, if it does a zero, it means the battery is getting low. Okay. So here I jump back and I lower the battery voltage, you know, the power supply voltage. So I drop it to about, I think, like 2.8 something. Then I go over back to the serial monitor just to show, okay, it's still transmitting and it's still showing that the battery is good, which it, which it should be, which is what we'd expect. Then I go back over and I lower it even more. And this time I'm going to lower it just below 2.75. So there I go to 2.73. And then all of a sudden... And when this becomes clear, you can see that it's now reporting the battery status as zero, meaning it's, it's telling the coordinator I have a low battery. Then I go back and I lower it below 2.6. So there we go, 2.56. And what happens here is it's hard to notice right away, but basically we're not getting any more printouts because now it's in shutdown mode. So now it's in shutdown mode. It's not going to send any more. So, you know, if, if you're the user and you see the low battery warning, you know you need to change it. If you see the low battery warning and you see that it stopped transmitting, you know it's in shutdown. And shutdown's nice, especially if you're using lithium ion, because you're not going to over discharge, or at least it's going to take a long time for you to over discharge it and gives you time to change it out. All right, that's it for part two.
In part three, we're going to take a look at the code, and I should have part three out pretty soon. For everybody that's been watching these and been commenting, I appreciate the comments. If you have any suggestions, if I got anything wrong, any questions or anything, please use the comment section, and I'll see you back here for part three. Thank you for watching.